So welcome to Pittsfield Green Drinks. Um, this event is sponsored by Berkshire Environmental Action Team. My name is Chelsea Simmons and I'm Meets Education and Outreach Coordinator. If you don't already know about us, you can find out much more um, on our website at thebeatnews.org. Our mission is to work together to protect the environment for wildlife in support of the natural world that sustains us all. On our website, you can easily stay informed um, just with environmental events, job openings, uh, projects, and public meetings. We have a community calendar where we compile a list of events that other organizations have has sent us um, in just one convenient place. And then we also have a environmental jobs board where we post uh, regional and local job openings. And then twice a month, we go through the state's environmental um, monitor and list the big projects for Berkshire, uh, for the Berkshires and Connecticut River Valley, as well as statewide. And then every week, the public notices page gets updated, and those are public notices for Berkshire, Hampton, Hampshire, and Franklin counties. Um, they're mostly conservation commission meetings, but there are other environmentally relevant ones there as well. And you can actually find everything I just mentioned um, on our uh, weekly e-newsletter, The Beat News. Uh, and that also has local, regional, national, global um, articles just about environmental news as well. If you'd like to subscribe to that, you can go to our current weekly newsletter page here and click subscribe. So many of you probably already know this, but um, B is a 501c3 nonprofit. So that means all of our um, funding comes from donations and grants. If you would like to support me, you can go here on our donation page or go to our donation page by cl clicking donate on our website header. Um, and thank you so much. Events like this one are only possible because of the people who support us. So next month, Mary Stucklin will be speaking at our June Green Drinks um, on Tuesday, June 21st at 6 p.m. Mary is the owner of Tommy's Compost and the founder of Berkshire Zero Waste Initiative. Uh, she will be talking about all things waste, uh, how to reduce your waste, um, easy ways to reuse things, and also how to compost and recycle effectively. If you'd like to find out more about that, you can go to our event calendar. And so that's all I have for you guys. I'm gonna hand it off to Joan and she can uh, introduce herself. All right, it's all yours, Joan. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Excellent. Um, let me just... Um, okay, I'm delighted to be here and uh, delighted to actually see a lot of... Um, uh, names or faces of friends uh, out there. So thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm also very impressed with what BEAT is doing. I think it's, you know, the environment needs the help of all of us in so many different ways. And um, thank you so much for inviting me to share um, a bit about flowers and their pollinators. So um, today I'm going to talk about how we might conserve flowers and their pollinators and particularly from the standpoint of someone who's studying flower pollinator systems. Um, and here on the cover, uh, the first slide, I just have a bunch of different pollinators visiting flowers. So from bumblebees visiting goldenrod to this beautiful surfeit fly visiting bunchberry dogwood, to mm. these beetles visiting uh, a composite in um, Betty's Bay, South Africa. Um, to a swallowtail butterfly visiting um, a uh, lily, to another beetle visiting um, a bunchberry dogwood. And I thought I would begin just by sort of celebrating the diversity of flowers that we see, just pointing out some, the diversity of flowers that we have in our lives. This is Lilium philadelphicum, the wood lily, 
And in particular, I wanna point out that it has these um, deep um, rust colored pollen um, stamens containing this deep rust colored pollen. And then this is the stigma here. So for pollination, the flower, the pollen needs to get from the stigma, stamens to the stigma and hopefully actually from the stamen of a different flower onto the stigma of this flower. Here is a miniature flower. This is Mitella nuda or miterwort here. Uh, more commonly around here, we have the two leaved um, miterwort, but miterworts are just beautiful flowers. And if you go in, out into the woods, you should take a hand lens with you so you can look at them. This flower is just a few millimeters across, but if you look at it closely, you can see it has these um, petals that look like feathers. And then critically, the part of the flower you need to focus on are stamens. And in two whorls here, there's an inner whorl of stamens that is already dehissed and has pollen on them. And there's an outer whorl of stamens, four of which haven't opened yet, so they're still waxy, and there's one that's opened. And those produce pollen. And then the stigma would be right on the tip here. It's a little out of focus, but it'd be right in the middle. And then the last flower I wanna look at closely is this lovely star flower, Trientalis borealis, which is in full bloom now. If you go into our woodlands, you'll see the, these delightful flowers. And here you can see also the stamens here, which are really cute because they pre present their pollen right at the tip of the stamen. And that pollen has to get from these stamens, hopefully from a different flower again, to the stigma here. So the reason why we have so many different flowers, flower diversity is in part because they use insects as couriers of pollen. This is the only, or the main group, there are a few exceptions, but the main group that uses insects to carry pollen from one flower to the next. And um, here you can see this bumblebee visiting goldenrod and Think of what pollination is. Pollination is the transfer of pollen which contains the sperm from the stamens to the stigma, which uh, is the uh, receptive part of the flower that allows a pathway to the ovules. And it turns out that pollination by birds and insects and mammals really drives speciation in flowering plants. And as um, Khalil, Gibran said, for bees, the flower is the fountain of life because bees get um, nectar and pollen and food from the flower. But for flowers, the bee is the messenger of love because without, without pollinators, um, they are not gonna have, be able to re reproduce sexually. So that's key in this whole story. Lucky for us, there are over 350 thousand species of flowering plants. And these are just a few of the ones that I've studied at Isle Royal National Park in the middle of Lake Superior. Um, and of course, there are many more there too, but we have over 350,000 species of flowering plants, which gives us a rich diversity to draw on. And lucky for us, flowers are designed to be attractive to animals. And that of course includes us. We're, I think we are drawn to flowers for the same reason that a bee or a fly or a beetle is drawn to flowers. The flowers are designed to attract animals and the way our neurons are put together really isn't that different from a fly. You might not like to think that, but um, uh, it, it's true. We, we, what a fly or a bee might like, we also like, and that really draws you uh, to flowers. So I have really three sections of my talk. The third one is gonna be the biggest section. But first, I just wanna emphasize the importance of pollination in our lives. Second, I wanna talk about how we're really in danger of losing both pollinators and our flowers. They are in a global decline, no question. And third, I wanna talk about two studies that I've done where I think better data can change how we protect flowers and their pollinators. So first pollination is important. Um, I think all of us would agree uh, that pollination is pretty critical uh, from a practical standpoint. Um, and that is insect pollination is required for most of our fruits and vegetables, not all of them, but a lot of them. And studies have shown that about 1500 crops require insects 
um, in order to set fruit and create products that we can eat. And in 2012, so these data are pretty old, but the estimated value of pollination services in the United States uh, was 29 billion. And that of course has gone way up and globally 200 billion. So the economic value of pollination uh, is really, really high. And if you don't have pollination, you're gonna have lower uh, food production, lower nutrition and lower food security. And if you'll bear with me, because this is something my students didn't know, and I'm not sure everybody actually knows this, but there is really an urgency to improve our food supply. If you look at um, the FAO report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world, and you look at two kinds of data, these data are either put in terms of the number of people who are undernourished, um, in millions, so that's on this axis here, as a function of date going from 205 to 220. Uh, or you can also put this in terms of the percentage of people undernourished. We were doing really well until about 2014. And since 2014, the number of undernourished people in the world has been either sort of staying about the same or actually upticking. And this uptick has been particularly prevalent more recently. So by 2020, there were 768 million people that were undernourished and that has gone up even higher. So these data are even two years old. This is from the 2021 state of food security. And it'll be interesting to see what the numbers are, but with climate change and with um, the war in Ukraine, uh, which is the center of um, farming and food production, um, we have seen an uptick even further in the number of people that are undernourished. So feeding the world is a big problem and pollination is part of the solution. The second point I wanna make about the importance of pollination is pollination maintains biodiversity. Um, if you don't have pollination, you're going to lose species. So if you have no pollination, fewer species, and if you just sort of think about it from a practical standpoint, pollinators determine gene flow, who breeds with whom in a system, and it's a mutualism. So insects depend on flowers for food. So if you don't have the flowers, the insects can't eat properly. And flowers depend on insects as couriers of pollen. So if flowers don't have pollinators, they cannot um, produce, um, reproduce. So it's a mutualism uh, back and forth. Okay, second main point, pollinators and flowers are in a global decline. And um, we can see this if we look at um, the whole concept of what we as people actually are doing to the earth. We're in the midst of a sixth extinction. Elizabeth Colbert um, laid this out beautifully in her Pulitzer Prize winning book. And flowers and their pollinators are very much a part of this sixth extinction where we are losing species primarily driven by human actions of one sort or another. If we look at the Royal Botanic Garden Q State of the World's Plants and Fungi, uh, the 2020 edition, they estimate that two in five plants are estimated to be threatened with extinction. We don't think of plants as being part of the loss of species very, uh, we think of sort of iconic animals, but plants are very much a part of this pattern. And lest we think it's not happening to us locally, that it's happening in some tropical rainforest, uh, there are studies that show that um, locally we are also losing species. This is a wonderful article that was published in 2019 on floristic change in New England and New York, regional patterns of plant species loss and decline. And just a couple of highlights from the abstract that I've put in, in this slide. We find floras across the region have lost on average one quarter of their native species, ranging from a loss of three and a half percent from the Finger Lakes region in New York to a loss of 53% of species on Staten wow. Island in New York. That's just a huge drop. And of course, this is a very densely populated area, but when you have these very dense areas, you lose species. 
Contemporary floras also have a higher percentage of non-native species than historic floras. The percent of non-natives has increased by one and a half to 19.7% across the region. So we're seeing this shift in species in our local flora. Pollinators too are very much a part of the sixth extinction. So this slide just gives you four examples of pollinators that are listed as endangered um, from uh, butterflies and skippers, also a lepidopteran to this tiny little Hawaiian, yellow-faced Hawaiian bee here to this beautiful and amazing bird, the iiwi, also from Hawaii. And I wanna talk a little bit, focus on this iiwi because Hawaii is losing its birds in an enormously rapid way. So this is the iiwi Ooh. visiting by the way, isn't it just beautiful? It's a stunning yeah. bird. Yeah. Uh, look at its feet are orange to match its big yeah. beak that's orange. And here it's hanging from this branch. And as we were watching it, it was visiting this purple flower here, which is a rubus, it's a raspberry. It's the native Hawaiian raspberry that lacks prickers. It's a raspberry without prickers, bright um, uh, magenta flowers and the iwi hangs and reaches up into the flower uh, to get um, nectar, really quite amazing. But if you look at this at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii, you can see what's happened to the birds. This is a wall of um, birds that are, have either completely disappeared from Hawaii or they think are going to disappear in the near future. And this is the line between the ones that are gone, 31 species, and the ones that have uh, are going. And it's just, you look at this wall and you just feel so sad. It's just really sad. Here's the iiwi slated to go, but I hope they can keep it, keep it as long as possible. But again, we can look at examples of pollinators that are closer to home that we are losing at a phenomenal rate. So this is a species of bumblebee, the rusty patched bumblebee, Bombus affinis. And if you look at its historic range, all of this light blue area here is its historic range. And all of these X's were counties where historically we have recorded the presence of the rusty patch bumblebee. And what you can see here also are where it is still remaining. And it's basically almost been extirpated from the east, eastern edge of its range. And it's primarily concentrated where these green uh, dots are these green dots are primarily concentrated on the western edge. There are a few green ones that are scattered in here, a couple in Maine where it's been spotted. But it once had a very, very large rain and it has declined. And in fact, studies uh, keep on coming out that show that insects in general are declining worldwide by huge numbers. Uh, we are losing our insects. And so this is of great concern because these insects perform important vital functions, including pollination. Okay, so we're gonna get now to the sort of meat of the talk where we look at um, how data, how looking at pollination systems in more detail can change, how we protect our flowers, how we think about pollination systems. And um, I'd like to tell you about two studies that I've been doing on flowers and their pollinators. And the first is to look closely at just one flower. And that flower that we're gonna focus on is this amazing flower called bunchberry dogwood, uh, Cornus canadensis. It has a new name, Camiperi climinum, but I just like to go by Cornus canadensis because it's what I'm used to. Um, but it, it does have a new name and I, I, I wanted to make that clear to you. Um, so this is a dogwood, a ground growing dogwood, and if you look at it closely, uh, what you see here is a whole inflorescence. So it's, this looks like one flower, but in fact, it's 30 flowers that are subtended by four showy white bracts. And then within here, within the center, there are 30 flowers and they're all in different stages of development. So here there are three flowers that are open uh, we, and you can see the dark purple nectar disc. And there are a bunch of flowers that look like this, like look like a cross. Those are gonna open next, they'll explode open. And then there are a whole bunch of little green ones that are gonna develop over time. So this whole inflorescence takes about 
um, two weeks to, to open all its flowers. So it opens over time. And um, what you can see here is that um, if you take one of those flowers out, pluck it out and um, look at it closely, what you see are four petals that are just held together barely by the tip and four stamens that are, and one of those petals has a trigger on it. And then four stamens that are bent in the bud, like handles of a teacup, but they're, they're held down. And if you just push this over very gently, it goes from closed to open really in the blink of an eye. It's very, very fast. And these are little flowers, they're only about two millimeters across. So if you were to look at it sort of in real time, this is what you would see when you watch these flowers. It goes from closed to open in the blink of an eye. So, We um, brought some of these flowers back and we tried to film them with a thousand uh, frame per second camera because we were very intrigued by this exploding flower. And these are taken over, each of these frames is one thousandth, one millisecond. And what you can see is that the action was too fast to capture with a one thousand frame per second camera. And we had to switch to something uh, faster and so we were able over the next field season, we had to wait for a field season, we got this very special high-speed camera, a Motion Extra HG 100K camera, um, which can film up to 100,000 frames per second, which I actually didn't believe this a camera could go that fast, but uh, they can and they can go even faster now. And we filmed it. So this is the camera set up here. This is my colleague, Dwight Whitaker, who's a physicist who got in on the fast action here. Um, this is my colleague, Marta Laskowski, who's a plant physiologist. This is Alejandro Acosta, who uh, was a summer student uh, working with us at Williams and who um, was given charge of dissecting out a flower without exploding it so we could put it on the stage. Alejandro um, was, wanted to be a surgeon. He had very, very good hands. And um, so we put this little flower under this, these lights. Um, it took a lot of people, one person, I think Marta turned on the lights, Alejandro did the, um, the exploding of the flower um, and Dwight um, uh, triggered the camera. And I, I guess I just watched on this. And uh, we finally were able to get a um, image. And this is what we got when we filmed it at 10,000 frames per second. which is just amazing. I've watched this many, many times and I'm still in awe of this tiny flower exploding at such, such a phenomenal rate. But what this flower did besides um, just be an amazingly fast flower and getting the record for the Guinness Book of World Records for the fastest blooming flower in the world. We actually got an email one after we published the blooming, how it bloomed, we got an um, email from the Guinness Book of World Records and they said Guinness Book of World Records for Bunchberry Dogwood. And it still holds the record as the fastest opening flower. And so it's held it since 2005. Um, and so it's pretty exciting. We have this phenomenal flower growing practically in our backyard. It's a northern forest flower. It grows on top of Mount Greylock. It grows on top of the dome in Vermont. Those would be the closest sites where you could actually see the flower in the field. But what it triggered in me was a whole set of questions about why do bunchberry dogwood flowers explode? That turned out to be the big question. And so I started to examine who visits the flower. Uh, how does this um, exploding uh, flower affect um, pollination? And it turns out that visitors are really difficult to track in real time, but we were able to put cameras on it. And I want to show you how hard it is to study um, flowers and their pollinators. So I'm going to play this video and you can see this is speeded up a little bit. But you can see there's lots of action, right? There's this big guy that comes through this way. And then there are a whole bunch of little guys that come through. 
And if you were actually sitting there watching this in real time, it would be very, very hard to keep track of these visitors. Um, so if you go to the next slide here, you can see um, the pathway of the big fly that comes through. So it starts here, it enters here, there it is. It visits these flowers in green, and then it visits this flower and then it exits. So watch again with those circles guiding you. But if you were actually watching in the field, it would be almost impossible. But if you have it on film, you can slow it down, you can go slowly, you can identify exactly which flowers they're visiting. And you can get all of the visitors. So what we did then is to take a flower's eye view. We recorded all the visitors to a flower over its entire bloom. So here's the thing that blooms for two weeks. We could, we could record every single visitor that came into that flower over its entire bloom. And we put out these, what we did that is put out these little field cameras. They're in a waterproof housing and you can just set them to take a picture every three seconds from dawn to dusk for the entire blooming period. This turned out to really revolutionize the way I looked at flowers and their pollinators. So what the time-lapse video allows you to do is you can get a near complete record of visits. You could never do this watching in the field with binoculars or just standing next to the flower. So it records visits all day and over the entire bloom so that you have a record of temporal variation, the variation in visitors over uh, time. You can also be more than one place at once. You can put out lots of cameras so you can record simultaneously at different sites, which turns out to be really critical to understanding how pollination systems work. So you get spatial variation. It minimizes observer interference. We actually tried doing observations standing as still as you could with binoculars and recording what came in. And that's really hard to do, especially if they're mosquitoes and you swat a mosquito and you just make a rapid motion and everybody disappears for several, several tens of minutes. It also minimizes sampling bias because you can sample a lot over and over in different places. So I'll tell you the results from one study we did for bunchberry dogwood at four different sites. This is an aerial view of uh, Edwards Island where we did our studies. And these are the four sites. We did site A, site B, site C, site D, and this is 100 meters here. So what you can see right off is that these sites are no more than 400 meters apart. That's only about four football fields. So that's not very far apart. And then we recorded the insects coming into those four sites to bunchberry flowers. And first I'm gonna give you the data just for one day. So if you compare those four sites um, on just July 2nd, 2013 from nine in the morning to nine at night, and you look at the species that visited, these are the species here, only two species were seen at all four sites. There were six species here that were present at three of the four sites, and there were eight species that were only seen at one site. Now, of course, these are pretty rare, but some of them are pretty important pollinators. The point is we didn't get the same pollinators at all four sites. Then we scaled it up. If you look at all four sites over the entire bloom period from the 22nd of June to the 15th of July, we actually scored over 33,000 insects. This was a lot of video scoring um, and we got um, a little bit worn out by it, but it was pretty amazing that we got 33,000 visitors over the course of the, at, at these four sites. But again, you see the same pattern. Um, if you look here, you see that the visitation at the four sites show differences among sites. There are 11 taxa that were seen at all four sites, but there were 29 species that were unique to one site. And again, oftentimes these unique visitors are rare, but sometimes they're really common, like this bee 
species was very common at site C, and it wasn't seen at A, B, or D, only at site C. We can look at those data a different way by looking at a Venn diagram. And these are, these are overlap and taxa weighted by individuals. And you can see here that there's not a complete perfect intersection for any of the four sites, that you have differences between site A, B, C, and D. And the idea here is that flowers use a diversity of pollen vectors um, and that the patches differ. So the first lesson from this study in terms of pollinator um, conservation is that every single patch counts because what you might have in your yard might be very different from what your neighbor has 100 meters down the road. So every garden counts that every little patch may be preserving a different set of insects. And we have a better chance of conserving pollinators if we conserve multiple sites. Second study is to look at a community level study, and this is closer to home. Um, this is looking at um, fall blooming asters and goldenrods, which are very much a part of New England's biodiversity heritage. Somebody had an aster up, I'm not sure which aster it was, but they had an aster on their um, little, instead of a photo of themselves on their little um, gallery picture. So I appreciate that. Uh, but here are all different species of asters on this top area and then different goldenrods down here, including a white goldenrod that still a goldenrod, but never mind. And um, I think the question I asked is these, these are critical flowers in pollination. And can pollination studies then contribute to ways to conserve these flowers and their pollinators? So goldenrods and asters, clearly they bloom in the fall, they start blooming midsummer, and they keep going right up through even some of the early frosts. They provide a really rich source of pollen and nectar for our fall pollinators. And of course, goldenrods are clusters of many, many, many tiny flowers that bloom over a long period of time. And this, I'm gonna show just again, a video of um, visitors to Soledago rugosa. And as you watch this, you will see these different um, pollinators come in feasting on the pollen and nectar. So the first you see a butterfly, the common ringlet that comes in. It's in the upper left-hand corner. Then it goes away. And the next you see this big chunky fly. Flies, it turns out, are really important. Don't, don't swat flies, keep them going. They're really important pollinators. And next you see a wasp that comes in. The wasps, the wasps stay there for a long time. They're also important. So you have to expand your idea of what a pollinator is. There's the honeybee that comes in. Honeybees are not native pollinators, but uh, they can provide an important pollination service. And finally, you get the bumblebee coming in. They're really fast. And now we're back to the beginning with the common ringlet. But just in that very brief period of time, you had all these different species coming in, all from different orders and um, feasting on the pollen and nectar. So these um, late blooming aster species are really, really critical in uh, maintaining our pollinators. If we look at what's happening to field habits, and fields are really great places for a lot of asters and goldenrods, though we do have asters and goldenrods that are forest species too but fields um, are really important for many of our asters and goldenrods. If you look at the state of Massachusetts and look at what's happened over time, in 1830, there was much more open data, less forest. We have uh, become much more forested, which in many ways is wonderful, but it means there are fewer field habits for uh, asters and goldenrods. Uh, but you can see that we, um, Massachusetts in general has become much more forested over time. And so one of the questions I addressed in my research was to ask, 
how do you manage fields to maximize floral resources for pollinators? And this is, um, we started to set up experimental plots in Hopkins Forest. Um, one of the areas here was being open to put in a weather station, which en encompasses this part of the, um, of the field, but they also expanded the field. And the question was what to do with the rest of the field. And so I put in a bid to put in uh, pollinator plots where we could use different mowing regimes. So here's that same outline of that field from the previous slide. Here's the weather station. And then we divvied up the rest of the um, open area into 16 plots of, um, and we did four groups of four. So we had A1, A2, A3, and A4. And we had um, two treatments. Either we varied the time of mowing from early or late, or the frequency of mowing, where we mowed every year or every two years. And so we had four possible combinations, early mowing every year, early mowing every other year, uh, late mowing, uh, which would be in October, every year or late mowing every other year. And uh, I got lots of students out. So we counted every single flowering stem in each of these plots over the years. And some of the results are shown here. I have lots of results, but some of the more significant results I'm gonna show here. So um, here is just one block, the A block. So if it's early mode every year or early mode every other year, you don't get very many flowering stems. So here each dot represents a different flowering stem for um, four different goldenrods, the grassleaf goldenrod, Euthamia graminifolia, and then three Solidago, Solidago gigantea, Solidago rugosa, and Solidago altissima. But you can see if you wait to mow until after October, you get a much denser array of um, species. You get all four species that occur in both plots, whether it's late annual, late biennial, and you get a richness of diversity and you increase your flowering stems by thousands if you mow later. It turns out that the goldenrod populations are still growing. So this is 2014 data and 2016 data. Even in the early annual, you get more, but in the late annual, you get much more. You get this, um, you get this uh, density of stems continues to increase over time. We also put our cameras on the goldenrods to see who was visiting. And we looked at um, early mow flowering stems that were short and isolated, because remember they're spread out from other um, individuals of the same flower. We compared those with late mow patches where you have taller plants, they're much taller, and in big patches, dense patches. And we recorded the visitors. And it turned out that uh, flowers in plots mowed later had significantly more visitors. So the pollinators are actually keying in on the taller, more dense flowers. So if you can have a density of flowers and you can make them tall, uh, you tend to have more visitors than if you have short isolated flowers. So that turns out to be important. So by late mowing, you greatly increase the number of flowering stems of fall blooming asters and goldenrods. You provide a much greater food source for overwintering pollinators. And you also have the potential to attract more insect visitors. So I think we can be creative. I think one thing that comes out of this is less lawn and more flowers is important. And I put this up because this is an idea one of my colleagues had, Heather Williams. Um, she did creative mowing in her lawn. I would have maybe made these little interspersed things wider, but never mind. You can be very creative in the way you make your lawn. She made a big spiral um, labyrinth and it's a double spiral. So when you get into the middle, you start spiraling out which I don't know how she did that, but it's very cool. And then she's letting the parts in between the pathway grow up 
And she said, those are for the flowers. So you could do something like this, even make it larger and have uh, more area for more flowers. So less lawn means more um, space for flowers. I know there are a lot of communities this year that have gone to no mow May, where they have decided to forego mowing their lawns during the month of May, which I think is a great start. But what about no mow June, no mow July, no mow August? I think what we need to do is you need to let those go longer because the pollinators live further than and flowers bloom later than uh, May. But no mow May is a good start. I'm not going to poo poo it. So there are two really sort of take home messages from the studies I've done in terms of how to conserve pollinators. One, by looking closely at one species, we see that pollination systems are flexible and resilient and flowers use a diversity of different pollen vectors. And pollinators in turn, of course, often forage from a diversity of different flowers, it's sort of a neighborhood model of pollination. But the big point here from conservation is that patches differ. So as many different patches as you can preserve, the greater um, diversity of both pollinators and flowers that you will preserve. Every garden counts, every patch of flowers can be important. Second, looking at a community of flowers, if we look at a large um, system of flowers in, um, and, and managing a field, if you mow late, if you let all the flowers grow up, you're gonna increase your floral resources for pollinators. And you can do that by mowing late, reducing lawns. It greatly increases the number of flowering stems for the fall blooming asters and goldenrods, provides a greater food source for overwintering pollinators, and it attracts uh, more insect visitors. So all of those things are really um, important. Um, and with that, I wanna thank um, all the people that have helped me um, over the many years I've been doing these studies, uh, including Audrey, I saw you in the audience, so uh, Audrey's here, but um, many people have contributed uh, along with many Williams students, and um, I'm happy to take questions. Great, and I think um, either people can raise their hand, put a question in the chat, or I think we're a small enough group that you could unmute and ask a question. We'll try it and see how it goes. Do you so, want me to stop sharing my screen or and go to a gallery view or? That would be helpful. Okay. There we go. Super. Anybody have any questions? I, oh. I have a question. Go right ahead. So I'm just wondering about, um, so I'm, you know, I'm the weirdo on my block who, who doesn't like pull, pull my golden rods, except, you know, if it's going to trip the mailman or something, but I'm just wondering, so the, the field where the golden rod was, it was mown in October. So like it was mown down and I'm just wondering, like, it, does that take away the caterpillar protection for over the winter? Yeah, I don't know. I don't actually know if it reduces the caterpillar. What I, I mean, every year when I mow, I think, oh, well, first of all, the goldenrods are still dispersing their seeds when that happens. So I think, I mean, that's why we try to look at mowing every other year. Somehow you have to keep the woody plants from coming in. Mm -hmm. um, there's not much difference between um, mowing every year and mowing every other year. Uh, but we think more invasives come in. So we're also trying to battle things like um, um, Japanese barberry and Rosa multiflora rose. And so you're trying to keep all that stuff down too. So um, it's, it's hard to know. I don't have a measured impact on what it, the impact it could have on caterpillars or on nesting sites for bees or other or or um, seed dispersal of goldenrods and other other you, you have to give up somewhere i think yeah but it is something to take into account thank you any other questions 
So, so what I understood you to say is that it's better to mow every year, rather late in October, uh, and that there's not that much difference if you mow every year or every other year, but if you mow every year, then you keep down the invasives. Is that I think to some extent we have we don't have the returns and we we do we have charted the invasives that are coming in, but I think things get, get just much, much more tangled if you wait and do it every other year. So I in my own yard I mow every year. I just um and I get beautiful goldenrod populations. Um yeah. All right, so I think I saw Vivian's hand first, and then we'll go to Sandra after that. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, fascinating presentation. Um, I was wondering whether you are <clears throat> involved with any efforts in Williamstown uh, to uh, work on the lawn issue and um, more uh, steps that, that are reflected in your own research, which I think is a gift to your town that you can bring your research to to them and I'd, I'd appreciate learning more about that. I haven't done much, you know, we have a wonderful um, be friendly Williamstown group and I've worked with them. Um, they have been much more active than I have in actually putting things into practice. Um, but I think they've, they've done a fantastic job. I also have worked some with the students uh, who are trying to get Williams College to convert more of our lawns into uh, meadows and we succeeded a little bit. We still have more to go. Um, and one of the areas the students were looking at was the corridor right along Route 2 um, uh, and trying to see how many of those areas could actually just be um, allowed to at least grow up on an annual basis and be uh, patches for pollinators. So um, I've done some of that. I should do more though. But I think each of us in our own towns can push for that. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's worth it. Awesome, thank you. And it's easy and it also uses less carbon because you don't have to mow all the time. I think we really need to move away from, from um, the, the curated lawn that is free of anything. I mean, diverse lawns are very exciting and the flowers that grow in lawns are, are uh, spectacular, including the dandelion. It's one of my most favorite flowers of all time because it does such interesting things. Well, I might, I don't have a question. We have several times had the health department from the city come to our home and say that we have to, we even have a fine that we have had um, and the woman said to me that the lawn attracts vermin which can cause like we had I guess a, a rabid fox in our area and so the squirrels and the chipmunks are the vermin and also we had a neighbor with Lyme disease and she was very upset with our yard because she says we're making, you know, that the the, um, the ticks come. So we're having all this stuff coming at us because we're having, you know, more of a natural yard, even in our backyard that, you know, it's in the backyard, it's completely fenced in. And then we've also had bear in our yard like a couple of times. So they're saying that when we're not mowing the lawn, and making our actual lawn, that it's attracting all this other stuff that's terrible. And it's like, you know, we had the $50 fine and we talked to the person and they said that it was okay, fine. And we didn't realize that we still had the fine. So now it's $150. And this is in Pittsfield or? What, what? Yes. Oh dear. And it's like, you know, whatever. And the, the neighbor who was upset about the tick situation, they have actually broken some of our tree branches because it was like hanging a little bit on their yard, which is a tiny little. And then the lady was complaining that, oh, you know, she can't see out of her driveway, which is not true. And it's like, they're just causing a trouble because 
of whatever. And it's like, it's terrible. You know, we're trying to be good with the pollinators, but then it's like attracting vermin and this and that. And oh my gosh, you know. It sounds like Pittsfield maybe needs to change its laws. And I'm not sure how much evidence there is for all of those things necessarily right. uh, doing what they say they're doing. I mean, I think they need to have evidence for that before they- Well, I was, I was crying when she came out, the lady, you know. I'm so and so sorry. the next time the lady came, I had Jeffrey talk to the lady because it was like, it just, and I don't know, it just is very upsetting. Yes, I wouldn't be happy with that either. But so Pittsfield needs to change its rules, I think. Definitely. I've heard some things about um, the regulations that Pittsfield has about the length of like the height of lawn. Um, so Leslie had a question in the chat. Does keeping grass long encourage tick populations? I don't know that it does. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it will, it will mean that you when you walk through the lawn, you might have a better chance of picking it up. I mean, to avoid ticks, I try not to brush against vegetation. Um, so that would be one thing. I mean, ticks do like to crawl up and then get on you, but, um, I, I, you know, you can mow pathways through your lawn that you can walk on. That would be the solution and still let the grass grow tall. So you don't have to keep it perfectly tall everywhere, but where you think you're going to walk or want to walk, keep it short. And that would be the solution to that. No, that's a great solution. Um, does anybody have any other questions? You can either unmute or just put it in the chat. Can I ask um, what, Joan, what your next study might be? Well, you know, I am already studying all the spring ephemerals in um, our local forests. And mm. I actually wanted to integrate that into the talk today because um, it's my latest research. And, but I just, I, I just gave a final exam this morning and I didn't have time to do it. So I've now put cameras on um, all of our local spring flowers and um, some of the patterns are very much the same as I got for the dogwood so that, you know, I have a patch on um, hepatica here and a patch on hepatica here. And uh, the visitors are really different. Um, or, you know, Dutchman's britches, which are, you know, these beautiful flowers and they're visited by giant queen bumblebees when they get on the flower, the whole flower sort of falls down. Yes. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the pollination networks of our spring uh, blooming flowers. And um, I have three years of data for some species. And where it's, again, it's really changing how I view flowers and their pollinators. I had no idea, A, that flowers would, would be um, visited by so many different insects. Um, and B, that it would be so diverse between patches that are, you know, just a few hundred feet apart. Um, and that pattern seems to be holding up um, really robustly, even across many, many different different species. So that it's very, very exciting. Um, the other thing um, that I didn't emphasize as much as perhaps I should, but the importance of flies. I know people think of bees as being our main pollinators, mm, but it turns out flies are, first, they're spectacular. Uh, but second, they're really workhorses in the pollination world. So um, there's a little fly that looks like a house fly that's really an important visitor to many of our spring blooming flowers. It, it's a musket fly, it looks just like a house fly. And you'd think, it, you know, if it was in your house, you'd swat it and get rid of it. But don't do that. You want to let the fly catch the fly and put it outside so maybe it can visit pollinators. Yeah. So flies are really important. So, you know, if you can all just take that little message home with you too, yeah. that would be really good. Interesting. Well, uh, are house flies pollinators? Yes. All flies. At Ooh. least some members of that family are pollinators. Yes, not all. Um, I mean, there are some nasty flies, so I, I don't wanna, you know, but there are many musket flies that are pollinators. 
Um, Jane is wondering, do the bumblebees visit squirrel corn as well as Dutchman's breeches? They do. So uh, they also visit squirrel corn, which is pretty cool. And um, that's the other thing in our spring flora. We often have suites of closely related species. So you have Dutchman's breeches that blooms first and just overlaps um, briefly with squirrel corn at a site. And I think that's um, a system where you have relay pollination. So the Dutchman's breeches gets the bumblebees all trained to visit that kind of flower. And then um, the squirrel corn takes advantage of it and uh, it has a very similar flower and the bumblebees switch onto that. So I, I call it relay pollination, it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions? Go ahead, Potter. Oh, I think now, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of uh, towns and communities are interested in being pollinator friendly. And I think there are various ways that they get um, acknowledged and put up signs and have a pollinator project. My very small town in Monterey is one. And we have a, you know, quite, quite a nice committee of people uh, putting in special little plots of plants just for the pollinators. And um, and yet the complexity of the situation is one that I is, is hard for even any, any of us with some training to, to grasp. And I, I love the simplicity of just, just don't mow your lawn so much. And I wish there were a way to get you know, that message out easily to people and how beneficial that is. So you don't really have to know that you know, every species of flower that you are now allowing to bloom, just, just mow just one little path and just, and so uh, I guess that's, it, I, I'm, what I'm getting at is something um, educational that uh, isn't too complicated because people have a will, you know, people, yes, I, I think pollinator friendly is, is a buzzword, you know, it's out there. Yeah. But, but then what? Yeah. I mean, that's why I think the message is simple. Any, any flowers count, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, you want, ideally you'd like flowers that bloom, you know, throughout the season, you'd like to provide resources throughout, but it kind of doesn't matter. Just plant flowers and then just let natural flowers grow up uh, by reducing the amount of lawn. Um, um, I, think, I think of it also maybe as roadways, if we can get our road crews not to have to mow the sides yeah. of the roads as often. Um, I think there are lots of little hidden places in parking lots. If you have dividers between um, yes. uh, rows of, of uh, cars, why not just let that grow up? Just, just mow it once a year. You can still keep it down, but you can let all the, the flowers come. And, and weeds are pretty good as flower resources too. I think maybe one simple message would be about goldenrod. Golden rods are, you know, because for one thing, they've gotten a, unfortunately a bad name because people mistake them for being the allergen that in fact ragweed is. But, um, but people notice golden rods, yeah. you know, and if, if they could come to understand that golden rods are your friend, golden rods are your good guy. And, uh, and they're easy to see. And if you could just like turn it around and learn to love them, uh, that would be one easy thing along with the don't mow your lawn thing. Yes, I'm it's, with you 100%. Goldenrods are spectacular. And we are the center of diversity for goldenrods. That's part of our heritage, our, our biodiversity. And if we can get people to love goldenrods, and I love goldenrods. I love them when they come out and they're a lemon yellow, and then eventually mm -hmm. they fade to this mustard yellow. They bloom for a really long time. There's species that you know talk about relay pollination that bloom early, mid, late, late, late. I mean, they, there is a whole series of them that, that bloom in sequence. Uh, they, they, they should be um, really uh, up there. It's really hard to get people to like goldenrods though. I've been working on it for a really long time. We how about a t-shirt? <laughs> no, that would be great. Love your goldenrods. 
That would be great. Bumper sticker. <laughs> and easy to grow, too. How many species do we have here in Massachusetts? Um, oh, gosh, I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I think in Berkshire County, it's 17 or 18. I'm not positive. That's just sort of pulling out of the back of the yeah. recesses of my, I could figure it out pretty quickly, but yeah. Uh, and then in broader Massachusetts, of course, many more. Yeah, wow. And then you put on top of that, the asters, which are also pretty spectacular. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Joan, for being here. This was you're welcome. Great. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and over the dinner hour too. So thank you so much. And everyone go out there and save the flowers and the pollinators. Yes. Yes. <laughs>